This presentation focuses on two contemporary Native American writers, Scott Mamaday and Leslie Marmon Silco. Both are still living and both have achieved great renown as translators of the Native American experience to the larger culture. We will start with Leslie Silco, a writer of multiple origins whose works reflect her alignment with the Laguna Pueblo tribe in northern New Mexico. Her best known works are Ceremony, published in 1977, and Storyteller from 1981. A second piece that you've been asked to read is by another well-known Native American writer, N. Scott Mamaday. His book, The Way to Rainy Mountain, won a Pulitzer Pl Prize in 1969. You've been assigned to read his well-known essay titled A First American Views His Land, which is easily applicable to the other assigned works that you've been asked to look at this week. To this point, we've mostly held to what's termed a Eurocentric or European-American based perspective in our look at the relationship between humankind and nature. When this, within this dynamic, we apply our perceptions as colonizers to those who we consider colonized and demonstrate value judgments in the language that defines the boundaries and relationship between us, the dominant culture, and them, the supposedly subordinate one. It is simply human nature to form these judgments and it requires self-interrogation of our own values and perceptions to become aware of our judging habits. When the subordinate culture finds its own voice, the dynamics between us and them are reversed when they describe us in their terms. Here you see a column of terms that define a native or indigenous viewpoint in opposition to a colonizer's viewpoint, which defines its relations to the world, the environment, and to time in very different terms. In the next few slides, we'll look at a couple of objects that reflect general aspects of Native American values and culture. For these next few slides, it is helpful to keep in mind that you are a Google search away from finding out more about anything that might make you curious. To begin, here are a couple of images that I've gotten good use of out of over the years. These are Native American sand paintings, which are generally made by tribes in western states. The artists use dyed sand instead of paint to create these intricate ceremonial drawings which have religious and ritual significance to the members of the tribe. In stark contrast to the view of art as something eternal, fixed, and permanent, here the sands of varying colors are applied to carefully but without any adhesive to a surface and then left to the elements where they, are eventu where they eventually deteriorate. The artists develop reputations based on their skill, the skill of their work, and even today they can become well known for their elaborate designs. Notice both images are ringed and both have 12 feathers positioned around symmetrically in groups of three. If you think about it, those might represent the equivalent of months of the year. Look at the internal details of the image on the right and try to identify those that combine with the circular rings to suggest the passage of seasons, the, the passage of seasons of the year. Then look at the image on the left. You might notice that the figure inside combines aspects of earth and sky, day and night, male and female, and other opposing dimensions that come together in this single figure. Finally, when the design was completed and the artist was finished, that beautiful detail and colorful image was left to the elements, left to be gradually swept away by wind and rain. From that fact, we see that the creation of a permanent work of art was never the goal. What other ideas might be valued in the culture that produces these images? Here's another image, that of the storyteller doll. These dolls are often ceramic but can be made from other materials as well. What is the gender of the figure in the middle? Does that detail differ between the images? What is the age of the larger figure in relation to the smaller figures that uh, sit on its sides? What family event is represented here? In the absence of formal schooling, as we Westerners understand the idea, what educational functions are being demonstrated here within this tribal context?
Here's another passage, a brief description of a geographical landmark in my hometown of Phoenix, Arizona. This school was one of several run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs through most of the last century, which were designed to give children from tribal backgrounds a standard conventional public education. The one in Phoenix was actually open until 1990, and as a high school basketball player, I was on a team that went there to play against their school team. Schools like this have been in the news recently for all of the wrong reasons, as their first goal was basically to get Native American children to develop patterns and habits more aligned with the mainstream American culture, and to suppress the values of their Native culture, which differed so markedly in many aspects. Please pause and review the passage which describe a means by which clock time, with its hours, minutes, and seconds, was an unfamiliar concept in most traditional Native environments. To us, to most of us, the idea of clock time is so entrenched that we seldom question it. But in Native environments, time proceeded according to a different logic, so it was important to introduce the values of the schedule and the clock and therefore the concept of efficiency. Within the school environment, therefore, it was used as a tool to promote assimilation. In the early years, in early years, these students were also required to wear uniforms and learn job skills. Some of you might be reminded of your own ex schooling experiences, and you'd be right to recognize that time is often used as a tool to assure compliance within a larger set of established social rules and practices. In those last three sides, you see aspects of a culture that values process over permanence, regards storytelling as a highly important family and community activity that unites the generations, and that values natural and seasonal time over a more rigorous concept of clock time. That brings us to today's first reading, which is taken from the Iroquois culture of the American North West, Northeast. A word of caution. This reading won't make a lot of sense with a first look, as it was never meant to be written down and contains, contains concepts that are foreign to our modern American viewpoints. But it is useful to get an idea about how other cultures explain fundamental aspects of the world's existence, and we call such accounts creation stories. For the anthropologist, the effort to compare the way individual cultures explain their existence has great value and significance. For the Western Christianized world, the account that explains creation is found, of course, in the book of Genesis. Please pause and review this slide to get a basic overview of what a creation story is and what it does. Here are some aspects of creation stories of all kinds, including Genesis, the one fundamental to main Western mainstream Christianity. The slide depicts various types of creation, including a birth, the hatching of an egg, a thought by some supreme being translated into action, or an immediate shift from order, disorder to order. It also records various themes associated with the world's creation, including those of separation, imperfection, tension, or sacrifice. Please pause to review this slide before you read the Iroquois story I've linked you to on the content page. Again, please be patient as you read, as the story doesn't exact easily accommodate our Western linear logic-oriented thought process. Finally, as you think about what themes you notice as you read this piece, as well as any points of intersection that you notice between this and the other two readings assigned for this week, please make note of them. The first of those readings is Scott Mamaday's First American Essay. A quick look at this piece in your textbook would be appropriate at this juncture, as would a quick review of his biographical thumbnail sketch provided by the textbook editors. You'll notice how Mamaday articulates a relationship to the land that differs from that of mainstream American viewpoints and is shaped by native values which tend toward the mythic, the cyclical, and the spiritual, spiritualized. 
Once you finish this piece, please stop and consider the questions posed on this slide and also whether you note any connections between the points Mamaday makes here and any aspects of the Iroquois creation piece that you've also read. If you read through the thumbnail biographical sketch in your text about Leslie Marmon Silco and the selection of her work ceremony, you might also note that she likewise draws attention through image, symbol, and detail to the contrasting views of landscape held by Nit Anglo and Native perspectives, a landscape that is managed, fenced, boundaried, and used according to a colonialist, colonialist ethos is held in contrast uh, to a restorative and spiritualized view of space within the indigenous mindset, and that's why the shell-shocked Tayo, the story's main character, is able to find solace and healing by reconnecting with these natural spaces. Finally, here are a series of questions that apply to this collection of readings as a whole. Please reflect on these questions as you consider the collective messages within the three readings and consider the relative strengths and weaknesses of both indigenous and Anglo viewpoints in relation to the distinctive environments that we all inhabit. For now, I'll thank you once again for your attention.